Hey, so today we're going to talk about my genetic results. Um, I had a video that was supposed to go before this clip of me getting the results, which was um, how I did the test, which was just a swab test. But either my computer or my camera ate the video. I can't find it. I've looked for hours. And I'm really bummed about it, but we're just going to go into the genetic results instead of me showing you um, how we did it and all that stuff. Um, I did it through GeneDX. Um, through my genesis and so we got the results I have a copy of them and I'm not going to read the whole thing to you I haven't decided if um, the genetic results are going to be um, public they are on my patreon though so if, if you wanted to see them you could join my patreon um, you can check in uh, my description box um, I may have made it public I haven't decided yet it is pretty um, it's my medical records, kind of, so um, I don't know if I want those totally public yet, or even ever. But I do want to go over the gist of what they say and all that stuff. My, my refrigerator is making a lot of noise. Let me go turn that off real quick. Okay, I'm back. So I got the genetic results, and they were unexpected. Um, I'm always out of breath. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but um, the genetic results that I got were unexpected. I was exper I was expecting to get like uh, I can't think now that I need my brain, but I was expecting Ehlers Danlos Syndrome type, uh, like the classical or the classic like one of those two. Um, vascular was brought up a little bit, but we thought that was more unlikely because it's more of the rare types of Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Um, but they found a different genetic disorder. Before I get into that one, I do want to say that he has diagnosed me with. EDS type 3, which is the hypermobile type, um, and um, also arthritis adrenal disorder. So he's diagnosed me with three things, two being clinical. Um, the gene that mutated is the RTEL1 gene, and I'll have it up on the screen. And the medical condition that they found is called dyskeratosis congenita. If I seem very low energy and out of breath, I apologize. It's just because I'm just really out of breath and I keep having to like take a big deep breath when I talk and then the whole sentence I'm kind of basically holding my breath. So dyskeratosis congenita from my understanding is a bone marrow, bone marrow, I can't, I can't pronounce it, bone marrow failure condition that causes a bunch of other stuff. And it's been over a week since I got the results and I wanted to process it. Um, I assumed when I got them that I would want to um, read the results on camera but um, when I got them, I was really sweaty and uh, didn't feel comfortable recording my um, reaction to it. Um, mainly because when I um, read the results, I did cry a lot. And for a week, I was very emotional, more than normal. And if you've watched my past videos where I'm like crying in my videos, I'm a very emotional person. And so reading these results... Uh, like it just kind of like put in a lot of fears that I had originally and kind of like confirmed those fears and processing that was really hard. I do want to say before I get into exactly what dyskeratosis is, I'm going to kind of give the gist of it and I'm going to make a better video about all my uh, medical conditions later on, uh, like I want to do a series. Um, but before I do that, I do want to say that I'm going to be talking about children and like the me having children and my thoughts and stuff like that and it can be considered um what's the word I think of the word now I don't want to use the word offensive because that's not the correct word it can be considered uh controversial that's the word that I want because my opinions might not line up with yours and if they don't then I'm sorry and, I, and I'm really worried about how well I'm going to be able to articulate exactly how I'm feeling and what I want to say and all of that like I've recorded this video so many times the first time it came out really well but I was blue because of my um, light because I have an Alexa uh, and she's now just saying hello <laughs> but uh, sorry but um, it's just a lot of stuff to go over and it's a lot to like my phone does never want to be quiet Okay. It's a lot to go over, it's a lot to process, and I'm still not really fully sure how I feel about it. Um, so, technically I have two genetic disorders. Um, well, one's a condition, I believe. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a syndrome, not a disease. 
and then Dyskeratosis congenita is a disease. And um, Dyskeratosis congenita is not considered to be terminal, but it is considered to be life-threatening. And so the fact that I went 22 years, because I'm 22 now, without knowing that I have it is kind of scary. Um, and so there's that to kind of process. And um, <clears throat> I'm thankful that I didn't like spontaneously die because of something related to the disease when I was younger, because that happens a lot. A lot of people die because they don't get diagnosed. And a lot of people even die once they're diagnosed because of either bone marrow, bone marrow, bone marrow failure. I don't know why I can't say that. Um, some types of cancers because my risk of cancer is like sky high. Um, what else? Lily saying hello. Can you say hello? You're the prettiest. You know that. Mm, you're the prettiest. Look. Oh, I know. I know. Look at her eyes. Look at your eyes. You're just so pretty. Yes, you are. You're just so pretty. Yes, you are. You're my little baby. Okay. She's done with us. I don't remember what I just left off of. So, uh, I don't know how much I'm going to talk about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, I think I'm going to focus mainly on Dyskeratosis congenita, and I might touch base on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and the Arthritis Adrenal Disorder. But it's mainly going to be about my thoughts and feelings and all that with the DC. I think I left off as it being fa as it can be fatal. It's not considered terminal, like, um, for instance, cystic fibrosis would be considered terminal. Um, dyskeratosis congenita would be considered life-threatening because um, the mutation in your genes itself is not going to kill you, <laughs> but the things that it can cause can kill you. It, well, the thing, it, the things that it can cause can kill you, which I'm not too sure exactly how um, accurate that is because again it is considered a bone marrow failure condition but let's like I don't know if I am but let's say that my bone marrow is a-okay right now it would it would be considered from my understanding life-threatening but not terminal if I had bone marrow issues then it could be considered terminal at that point um, but again I'm very new to this so don't hold me to anything because I'm still learning about it and there's not much out there so um, I'm going to end up trying to learn as much as I can about it and make a video directly informing all about it related to all of my medical conditions. But until then, this is just like the result and I'm like babbling a lot so I really apologize. Like I said, bone marrow failure, certain cancers like leukemia, cervical cancer, um, what else? Any kind of cancer downstairs basically from my understanding. I don't know what else. Uh, related to cancer wise. It can cause pulmonary fibrosis which is a lung disease that is fatal and then they, it can cause oh goodness there's so many things and he just like touched base on a few of them on this paper. It can cause low blood counts causing anemia and low plates with bleeding di diethis or something like that. I'm not too, too sure. But it can cause skin fragility itself, scarring, and nail dysplasia, which is basically just like you you might not have any nails at all, or your nails might kind of look a little fucked up. I don't know how else to say that, but just rip the band-aid off. I have one nail that looks a little weird on my toe, but it's not like it's a huge deal. It just kind of looks like it's there's a crease in the middle and the bottom part, so like this part of the nail is folding over on top of it but it's very small and I never really noticed it until I started looking at my nails so it's not an issue. Um, skin um, pigmentation issues can be an issue and I do have that every now and then. It's not a permanent thing for me. I don't know if that's um, how it is for other people. I think it is permanent for some people and I think it can come and go for others. Um, um, but don't hold me to that. For me though, specifically for me, they, they don't always look messed up. Um, but at times they look can, they can look splotchy. My chest can also look weird at times. It can have like splotches that's kind of bluish. Um, my boobs can kind of look a little bluish at times, but it's not that it's it doesn't make it look any like not appealing. It's just like it kind of looks like my skin is splotchy. It's not a big issue. 
and I never really had a big issue with it. Forgive me, because I don't know how to say this. But autosomal dominant inheritance. So that means that I have a 50% chance of passing it on to any children, and I got it from my mother. Um, we believe she's a silent carrier. Um, I think she would need to be fully tested um, to know if she has it, but she I don't think she wants to get tested. Um, she kind of, I don't know, I think she's going through her own stuff and, um, and like, figuring out how to accept it and all that stuff. But it did come from my mother, um, both the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is, a, is assumed to come from her and also the DC does because we genetically tested both my parents and me. My brother has a 50% chance of having the disease and then if he has the disease, depending on if it's dominant or whatever, um, it would be 50%. But I'm not too sure if it would be dominant because I do not understand genes very well. Um, so um, I am in the clear for any other types of ehlers danlos syndrome like the vascular type. But again, I do have fatal, a condition that can be considered fatal. And so that's a... Uh, my camera's gonna die. Um, I want to talk about kids when I come back after it's charging a little bit. So when I come back, we'll talk about that. Um, bear in mind that this is individual for me. It doesn't have to be something that you agree with. Um, and I'm going to try to explain it the best way I possibly can. But remember, my mouth and my head do not like to line up. So um, yeah. So I had to stop filming for a second and my camera was dying. Um, but I'm gonna cut in the middle of what I was saying because there's something I wanted to talk about before I talk about children and all that. And so, um, ignore my hair. It's the middle of the day and I'm staying up longer than I would like. So, something that I want to talk about before I talk about children and my opinions about that, which I'm a little nervous to get into that, but I'm going to anyway, is that about pulmonary fibrosis. Dyskeratosis congenita can cause pulmonary fibrosis, and I'm pretty sure it can probably cause some other lung diseases, but the main one that I know about would be the PF, um, and I'm going to refer to pulmonary fibrosis as PF and dyskeratosis congenita as DC. So um, I have been out of breath for over a year now, I would say, and it has been increasingly getting worse. It's very, very aggravating and very, I hate to say it, but disabling at times. Like, um, you know, I have the POTS and I have, and I have mast cell and both of those things can cause um, shortness of breath, but they wouldn't make my um, oxygen levels drop. I've had several different pulse ox meters. Hopefully I'm saying that right. I'm gonna call it a pulse ox. Um, and, and I've, increasingly had my oxygen levels drop and I'll show them up here and um, it's been very concerning because so far the lowest it's been getting is in the 70s um, majority of the time when that happens it's after like I've cleaned a little bit I might have just taken a shower I might have been cooking um, any kind of like minor movement related thing can make my oxygen levels drop a few times I've been laying down or sitting down and it's been going pretty low but majority of the time it's when I'm up and moving which can be the first stages of PF. We're gonna let them pass. Okay, they passed. Um, for um, supplemental oxygen is needed once it's under 90, and so that's very pretty concerning. I really do not want to have to go into um, supplemental oxygen. It just seems very annoying and aggravating. But if it made me feel better, and I could like talk better without like gasping for air and having to cut it out all the time in my videos that'd be really nice um when i'm talking it constantly feels like i'm holding my breath which is just obnoxious and it used to not feel like that and um being apologizing for breathing loud all the time it's really 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 annoying the symptoms are there and it, they're very annoying and they're becoming increasingly worse and that is um frightening scary concerning a bunch of words and um, two doctors now have told me that I need to see a pulmonologist and I'm in the process of making an appointment um, I have one appointment already in October but I found a specific doctor that's um, at a particular um, um, place 
that has worked and done research um, related to like, um, I think it's for, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but telomere, uh, let me get it online, hold on, telomere links. And DC is when the ending of your chromosomes are shortened. And so he's worked with related disorders, uh, diseases like DC and I believe specifically with DC because the telomere um, association actually got me in touch with them and a oncologist doctor that I might end up seeing. She's in um, Houston though and I'm in Dallas area so that's a four hour drive and I can barely make a 30 minute drive. So I don't know how I'm going to do that. It'd be very hard for my parents as well because they work um, and taking off is just pretty hard um but being in the car all day and then at the doctor all day and then at the, in the car all day it's just gonna be very very hard on me and my mom too so i don't know how we're gonna do it but we're, we're gonna try as best we can but um about this pulmonar pulmonologist i'm gonna be seeing him soon i believe um i gotta get an appointment they're gonna call me back and schedule that but I'm really very concerned because if I do have PF, I don't know how I'm going to process that because PF majority of the time is terminal. Um, from research online, it's two to five or three to five years. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, well, don't research. But I'm not the type of person that's going to get scared from research. I want to know the more knowledge I have about something, the better I feel. And um, I don't know how to say this, but I don't like bathing myself. I really don't. The anxiety about possibly having it would be a lot less than wanting to research it and not allowing myself. And some people won't understand that. And um, some people e could even um, claim the, um, what is it called? I forgot what they call it. Hypochondriac thing. And that's not what it is because when you have two doctors that have suggested that you see a doctor related to pulmonary fibrosis, then it's a big, it, it's not something that you're afraid of anymore it's something that could actually be a reality and when your oxygen levels are showing something wrong with your lungs it's a reality and um it's something that i have to face head on because if i do have it then the, the just amount of work in order to keep myself healthy is going to be ridiculous um, i'm probably going to end up most likely being forced to get a feeding tube at that point i'm trying everything in my power not to the reason I would get a feeding tube would be strictly for medicine. I might do um, supplemental feeding every now and then, but it would mainly be for meds, which is uncommon, yes, but I'm in a very particular extreme scena like scenario or whatever you want to call it. And medical care is very much based on the patient. And at this point, I can't breathe. Hey, um, a feeding tube kind of makes sense and it would most likely be a J tube not a G tube because if um, the reason I would be getting one is because I can swallow pills fine it's just I vomit them up and I vomit food too but thankfully I've been keeping my weight up um, which is basically just me not giving about giving a shit about feeling gross I'll eat anyway which really sucks but um, I did that to avoid a feeding tube and you know, I'm still going to do that because I really don't want to do supplemental insurance and nutrition. But um, to get a feeding tube strictly so I can take medication because I have a bunch of these medical conditions that could be possibly improved with medication and I can't take anything. Um, which is really aggravating. Um, because like I had a really bad infection and I ended up having to go in the hospital to get IV infusion. No, yes, IV and antibiotics um, because I just couldn't take the stupid pills. I would throw them up within 20 minutes, which is just obnoxious. And it was getting to the point where my fallopian tubes were so huge that when they first did a scan, um, they thought that I had an appendicitis, which it's got to be obnoxiously huge. So, um, you know, a feeding tube... Is something that's probably going to be in my life one day and I really don't want to do that but if I do have pulmonary fibrosis it's going to force me into that and 
I don't, I guess I just don't really know how to feel about it. I, I'm kind of venting to y'all, which feels weird, I guess, but like, um, I'm only 22, and so I'd be very young um, to have this. Most people have it because um, they went through like cancer, um, lung cancer radiation, and that damaged the lung, or maybe they're a smoker, which I have smoked in the past. But um, the cause of mine would be the DC, I'm messing with my table, but the cause of mine would be the DC and rheumatoid arthritis can also cause it. So I have two medical conditions that can cause it. Gotta figure out if I have that and if it's not that, what's causing the issue. Um, I highly doubt, both my doctors highly doubt it'd be the mast cell. There's something else that has to be going on. Um, we also gotta check a bunch of blood work and we're going hopefully to the lady that's in Houston to um, figure out what kind of blood work to do because my GP's never heard of DC and I'm doubting any my other doctors have either because it's just so incredibly rare. Um, but um, thankfully was able to find a Facebook group that can get me in touch with the, with the Telomere Association and they were able to um, get me in contact with some doctors. Um, and I actually have an unboxing from a care package from them coming out after this video, so look forward to that. Hopefully it'll come out a little bit sooner than like a month after this video. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, but I have a lot of doctor's appointments coming up. And, um, so that makes that, that and being sick really makes it hard for me to edit and film a video. Now I want to talk about kids. I need to turn this down though. Sorry about that. This is probably going to be annoying me when I'm editing, but I needed to turn that down. It's super, super bright. Okay, as I was saying before I turned the light down, um, I want to talk about kids, and I'm really, really nervous to talk about this because everybody has their own opinion, and my opinion could probably be considered um, controversial. But nowadays, every single person's opinion is controversial, so what am I going to do? Eat. But I have a 50% chance of passing the dyskeratosis on to my kid, kids. Um, I don't have any kids now, and um, at this point in time, with the rate that my life is going, um, being housebound, barely being able to take care of my cats, let alone myself, um, it seems very unlikely that I would be healthy enough to have, to be a mother. And I'm not specifically talking about biologically here. Um, when I'm talking about passing it down, it'd be biologically, but when I was in high school, and even now, I really, really wanted to be a mother, to the point where I carried a journal around, and whenever I thought about a baby name, I would write it down in, uh, the, in a book, and that was specifically aimed for being a mother. I took, um, children development classes, and I figured out very young what my parenting style would be, I forgot what it's called, but... Um, I figured all that out. I decided I'm playing with my water bottle. If you like water bottles, I totally recommend you get this one. I'm definitely not sponsored. But it's the C-O-T-I-G-O -O water bottle. You can get it from Target or like Amazon. It's amazing. I really like it because it has like a, a straw kind of built in and I need a straw. Um, but it won't like hurt my teeth if I tick and I push it up. It won't feel good, but it won't break them either. Um, and it helps. So I like it. Anyway, 50% chance if I have biological children. And if my kids directly, sorry about all the breathiness. If my kids directly do not get it, the likelihood of one of them or if I only had one child, this is all hypothetical here, um, being a carrier is I, it's pretty high too. It's you know, 50-50. And so that would mean we're gonna we're under the assumption that they're carriers at this point. If they're carriers, then somewhere down the line, one person in the family re resulting from me would most likely have the DC diagnosis or the gene mutation, whatever you want to call that. And um, I, I'm so sorry about the sighing. It's I, I'm just I feel bad about it. But, um, ah, you're a biscuit. Ha! Huh, huh, biscuits! Woo! You're a biscuit! Ha! Huh, you're a monkey! Woo! 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 You're a biscuit! Woo! Ah, you're a biscuit! Ha! 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 Woo! 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 Ha! Ha! Woo! 
sorry, they needed to say hello. Um. Hmm. <laughs> It ticked so long that the camera like cut off of me. Goodness. Okay. We're back. Um, uh, I this again. This is gonna be controversial, most likely. I could not. Who I don't wanna cry. I cannot forgive myself if I passed it on to my children, let alone their children. Um, that would really hurt. And it's, and I feel weird saying that because I don't want my mom to feel bad because I did inherit it from her. And, you know, she didn't know. But, like, knowing what I'm going through and, like, just all the medical bills and everything, um, I don't think, and maybe that's selfish, but I don't think I could, um, just watch them go through all of it and realize how hard it's going to be and especially how hard it is to find a doctor that knows about it because it's just so goddamn rare that it's obnoxious. I think there's only 7,000 people in the world with it at this point. Uh, let's get the population. Hold on. Alexa, what's the world's population? According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the world population today is approximately 7.6 billion. So it's a lot of fucking people and it's one in a million or less than one in a million so it's roughly 7,000 people in the world that have this disease which is very very small to put it in perspective with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome I think it's 250,000 people Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome okay so compare Comparing it to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, according to Google, I know some people um, um, argue that it's not rare, um, but 200,000 U.S. cases per year, and there's only 7,000 people uh, living with this keratosis congenita. A few years ago, there was only 2,000, I believe, so it could be even s lower than 7,000. Um, that, again, the 7,000 is with my own math. And I'm definitely not a math expert. But it would either be that or lower. So, um, it's very, very rare in finding a doctor that knows about it, has heard about it, and has done more than just read about it. Um, very hard. Um, you know, you can go to, to, you can go to medical school and read a small paragraph about something, but you're not an expert about it. And finding a doctor that, like, that wants to, to um, I can't think of another word besides ex be, be an expert about a very, very rare disease is going to be very low because their patient, um, the amount of patients that they're going to see is very low and it's not going to really be worth it. So as I was saying, I would feel very, very bad and I don't think I could really forgive myself if I was sitting there watching my child suffer because of my selfishness to have a child because I really, really, really would like, love to have a child. Um, just the ability to watch them grow and to see what kind of personality they're going to have and how they mold um, into a beautiful human being and be there for every little thing that they could possibly do would just be extraordinarily amazing and just everything that I would really want. Like if I was just able to be a mom, I'm sorry about crying. I would feel very, 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 um, what's the word, content with my life. I'm very happy. And don't get me wrong, I am happy now and I'm glad that I'm here. But the main thing revolving around my life at this point is my illness. And that sounds sad, but when you have to see so many doctors all the time and you're housebound, that's all you do and there's not really at this point in time there's not really anything I can do about that it's not like I can like put my care off and space out my doctor's appointments because I would put my health at risk but um if I was going to be a mother I think it would be a lot better to adopt and I don't want people to think that would be my last resort it's not like oh 
I'm sick. I, I'll just adopt. When I was in high school, my my goal was to to get married, adopt, and then have children, biologically. I wanted to do the whole package. Um, and I'm at the point now where I don't think I could adopt. There's a big thing of um, adoption companies um, ah, ah, discriminating against me. Um, and then there's also the realization that I don't think I could be the best mom at this point in time. I can barely take care of my cats, like I said, and a lot of times my mom has to help with certain things, like the litter box. If I was to have a child and, it, and considering it being adopting, um, my spouse, whoever that would be, would um, have to take on a lot of the responsibility, not, uh, not only for the child, but for me too. Because let's face it, when you're in a chronic illness, your partner is also a caregiver, unless you're like rich and have perfect health care, um, in-home health care. It would really depend on the person that I would be end up with. I don't know who that is. I'm single at the moment. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it'd be a really good thing to do at this point, point in time. I don't think that that is permanent. You know, if I have an amazing partner that's willing to take it on, I might have to consider it if I'm going to do that, but then I also have to consider the child because I would want to be a very active parent and at this point in time, I don't see myself being able to do that, which would really suck. I would want to be able to do things with them and like go to the zoo and um, all that stuff. So I would probably need to be a little bit more grounded medically and, um, and have like less doctor's appointments and stuff like that. And then there's another thing. Dyskeratosis is not considered um, a terminal illness, but it can cause fatal things. And so being a mother and then possibly dying young, that seems like a great idea, you know? So um, there's multiple reasons why I don't think being a mom at this point would be a very good idea. And not every, it's not set in stone, but as of now, thinking about it, um, it's probably not a good idea. And um, I hate to give up on that because it is a very big dream of mine, but Part of being a good mom is doing the best thing for your children. And even though I don't have children, in my heart, I, in a way, I kind of do. Because it would, although it would, like, there are so many people out there that need homes, um, they need somebody that's going to be able to be 100% active in their life. Um, and I just, I, um, I'm not bashing people that decide differently. I just personally want to be a a very specific type of mom and I don't think I could do that. My sleeping schedule is really messed up. Um, I'm not up very long at very long and when I am up there's a chance that I wouldn't even be able to see them if they're at school because I, um, I wouldn't be able to teach them at home. Um, so um, there's just a lot of things that I would miss out on because of my body being a pure asshole and I think that would hurt me more than not having kids now and so some of it is a little selfish but some of it is in the um can't think of the word but for the child deciding not to have any biologically or adoption wise um so it's not the fact that I couldn't love somebody that was sick I very much could like if I could afford it and I adopted somebody that was ill um, so that wouldn't bother me um, it would be harder on me and so it's probably not a good idea again because if I can barely take care of myself taking care of an ill child would be even harder than taking care of a healthy child um, and you know you can never guarantee things and so if I was gonna be a mom I would want to make sure that I could do the best I can and at this point in time I do not think that I could do the best I can and that hurts very, very bad, but sometimes you gotta make decisions that are painful, and I think this is one of them. Again, if it changes, then I'll let y'all know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as of now, I don't think a kid would be a good idea, 
Um, and I was even thinking about this before I got the PF die. I mean, not the PF. Before I got the DC diagnosis. When I assumed it was just ehlers down Syndrome. That's a genetic disorder too. So, um, you know, um, didn't want to pass that down either because it's very painful and it's aggravating and it's expensive too. Finding a doctor that wants to treat you is hard and all that stuff. It's really hard to look at the camera with the ring light. Um, but, um, I think that's really much it. Um, I'm not really going to touch base on the arthritis adrenal disorder, I don't think. I can let you know what it is, but there's not... I, I Google it, I don't see anything coming up about it. It's a receptacle skeletal and dysautonomia symptoms. So it's kind of like a bundle of EDS with a different name from my understanding. But my gene is dominant, so the fact that's why it'd be a 50% chance of passing it on to my children. And then I could touch base with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, having a child with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is also considered a high-risk pregnancy. And then DC itself can also cause infertility. So there's a lot of things playing a role in that. And um, it's really complicated and all that stuff. But I can barely keep my eyes open and I can barely look at the camera. So I'm going to talk to y'all later. Um, don't forget that I love you. Thank you for staying alive. Remember, you know your body better than anybody else, so please listen to it, and I'll see you next time. Bye.